Hello. Thank you all for coming. Okay, so um, let's let's start off by talking a little bit about how you got involved in music, how you grew up uh, with music, and you know how you actually got involved in, in, with with bands and as a songwriter. Uh, you all really want to know? But first, let's let me take a oh, selfie. Oh. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a very non-musical family. Um, none of my family members have ever been musicians or ever actually influenced anyone in the family to pick up music. Um, but my father is an avid audiophile. So the, the environment that I grew up in was, hey, hi. The environment that I grew up in was one that was filled with gear. Any of you like collect gear or sound engineering majors or you know, you know how, how precious and valuable gear is to all of us. So my house would typically be this is the situation in my house, okay? I would open the door and I'll trip over a couple of XLR cables and then I'll fall on uh, a preamp, roll over a power amp, and then a speaker falls on my head. Uh, so my whole living room is basically acoustically treated. Um, and I used to hate that growing up. I used to, I think, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you're younger and your parents force you to go to piano class and you're like, oh, why the hell am I doing this? I hate piano. I was kind of like that. Um, he would play like fusion jazz. Uh, he would play Al Green. He would play like the old school stuff. He would play Jimi Hendrix like all day and all night long until without knowing I would be able to recognize these tunes. And only later when I grew up, grew up that I realized, hey, this is actually a, a tune from so and so and so and so. And um, that was the typical living environment for me growing up. Um, musically, to be honest with you, um, I started off uh, playing percussions at the mosque because I was forced to go to the mosque uh, as a kid. Um, so I would, I would have like trainers from, from Masir, from Medina, come down from the UAE to come and teach us uh, techniques on how to play the darbuka and, and oh. stuff like that. So at age 13 and 14. And then um, I realized that, to be perfectly honest with you guys, since we're having like a casual conversation here, right? To be perfectly honest with you guys, I realized that I wasn't getting the chicks <laughs> by playing Middle Eastern percussions. <laughs> so, I decided to start singing. And um, the main reason why I started singing and writing songs, and my motivation in, in, in songwriting has always been women. Because I've always been insecure with the way that I express myself. And uh, I never actually figured out a way to actually until now, I've only asked for a girl's phone number once in my entire life. And um, I have never really had that sense of expression where, you know, I'd go up to someone and say, hey, I really like you and can I have your phone number? I would hide in my bedroom and write songs about them. And, and the first couple of songs as a songwriter that I wrote were, I love you, Nicole. Why won't you look at me? That kind of stuff. We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all been there. So, um, to be perfectly frank with you all, since we are having this uh, open, casual discussion, it, my motivation has always been women. And um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing if your motivation... I mean, it depends on you what your motivation is, but my motivation has always been trying to impress people. And when a girl says to me like, oh, I don't quite like that tune, I'll be like, something's wrong with me, I need to improve myself. And then sooner or later I realise that, hey, um, just singing itself a cappella is not turning her, her on, it's not working apparently. So I decided to go for the most convenient thing next to pick up the guitar as well. And I, I picked up the guitar at age 14 and started like self-teaching myself. And uh, I was so involved in, in, in writing songs and playing video games. So that's my life basically, until now even. It's always like writing songs or playing video games. So I got so involved in it that I was trying to rebel against, against what the common perception of me was like when I was younger I was in the express stream and in my school um, I was like one of the two one of the two people in the football team that were from the express stream so everybody sort of had this preconception of me that like you're, you're a smart ass you know just because just because I mean I am a smart ass but just just because you are you are a certain uh, level difference from them I guess but um I got so involved in, in what people think of me 
that I, I flunked my I flunked my O levels one. I didn't turn up for my papers. I was so convinced that I could do music for a living that I thought I didn't need to study. And you know when you're a rebellious teenager, you sort of think like, I can do anything I set my mind to without even realizing the consequences that are about to come and stuff like that. So I was so convinced that, you know, I'm gonna be a singer, I'm gonna be a songwriter, I'm gonna make shit ton of money. Um, I don't need school. So I got my results and You've all got, gotten your O-level results before, right? And you know that it's like, oh, you haven't? Okay, so, so it goes like A1, A2, B3, B4, whatever. So I look at my results. And now the five subjects or six subjects that I, I, I took, only four were listed. So I was like, why the hell are there only four subjects? One was a dash. And then I, I went ahead and asked my teacher, so why is there a dash on my sciences? She said, a dash is when um, it's worse than a fail. <laughs> it's ungraded and I was like I always thought that I could get by life just by getting by you know and that was the point that I realized that I actually needed to put in some work so I had no choice but to enroll myself in the Institute of Technical Education where I had a perfect GPA of 1.0 that's bad, by the way. <laughs> That's a, you just made it. Um, I had a GPA of 1.0, and then I was, at that point in time in my life, so lost, so confused, and I did not know what to do with the future at all, because when you're young, you don't really think of like, how I'm gonna make money, and you just think of, ah, oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. But at that point, I was so lost, that I started just playing music out in the public, out in the open, and I got introduced to a couple of musicians. And one day while I was illegally busking at Clark Key <laughs> under the um, what's underpass, I got introduced to this musician called Ridwan, Ridwan Zalani, he's a percussion player. And he told me that, um, why don't you start taking your music career seriously? Why don't you start taking your singing seriously because you have a beautiful voice? And I've never really had anyone tell me that before. Um, so, he was telling me about the courses that I didn't know at that time that you could study music even. Um, everything was very uh, straightforward for me. You either go to J junior college, you either go to polytechnic, you either go to ITE. It never occurred to me that a career in music was possible at that point in time. So, I got introduced to a couple of music courses in, in La Salle. And uh, I auditioned for, for a vocal course in La Salle. And they accepted me with the condition that I had to study up to grade 5 theory in a month to pass the entrance exam. So I did pass the entrance exam, so I studied grade 5 theory in a month. I don't even know how I did that. But um, so in that month, my father, the avid audiophile, said, um, never in my life will I allow you to become a singer. I don't think there's a future in, in becoming a singer. And so I was on a high and I went tumbling down again. But somehow I came to a compromise with him. I, I told him, why not I study music technology? Like, I probably know all these inputs and outputs more, more than any 17, 18 year old at this point in time. And um, so he allowed me to go I used up all of his uh, CPF to actually, because we don't, we don't really come from a, from a very well-to-do family, so I managed to convince him to use his CPF for me to study music because I was so sure of myself. I was so sure that I was going to be, I was going to, I was going to make it. So when I was in La Salle, that was when I had my first culture shock because I've always thought that I've had this, as a young musician, you have this um, benchmark that you think, I'm right here. I sound so much better than all these other guys on YouTube. I'm right here. And when you go to music school, everyone's practicing yeah. six hours a day after classes. Yes. Six hours a day. And we're talking practicing, not like playing or jamming. We're talking like practicing. And I'm, I'm there like 
la 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 la, where are all the pretty girls? <laughs> and that was the first culture shock for me because that sort of taught me to be disciplined in my music and I started to realize that, hey, I'm, sh I'm totally shit right now. I'm not as good as I think I am. So being in music school, apart from meeting uh, a lot of people who are now in the industry as well, uh, I learned the importance of discipline. And because I think as musicians, we sort of come up with our own schedule. Like if most of my friends, if you don't teach or you don't play at night, you sort of, you, you mold your own day, you know, like uh, I'm going to wake up at noon today and then I'm going to make lunch. Uh, my gig's at what, nine? I'm going to chill, talk to my mom, cuddle my cat for a while. Uh, so we sometimes, more than often, we forget that discipline is a very important routine that we as musicians need to set for ourselves. No matter what the, um, no matter what your major is, no matter, no matter if you're, you're a pianist or, or you're a sound engineer or you're a producer, or like me, if I'm a songwriter, I forced myself to, to get up in the morning, turn on my studio, play a couple notes, even if I don't get a song out, just um, get pieces of songs together. Um, even if you, you are lazy or you're tired, just pick up the guitar, you know? I just force myself to, to warm up my fingers or, or to practice for a good hour or two before I start having breakfast or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, that itself taught me that we as musicians or as upcoming musicians, the most important thing we need to do is to really have self-discipline. And after which, I, I sort of wasn't doing too well in school, by the way. So uh, having to compete with pianists and, and musicians that are already grade eight and above, having no experience in reading and writing music to suddenly having to study diploma level music theory, it's, it was totally overwhelming for me. And at that point in time, I just started a new band called Juxtapose and we were, we were like doing the night gigs, we were doing the skate gigs, we were doing the indie gigs. And um, we got an agent who hooked me up with like the whole bar circuit. So in like 2007, 2008, I was doing like the Irish pubs and everything that I'll finish at like 2 or 3 in the morning and not turn up for class at 8. My attendance would be completely zero. And in my mind, I was like, Again, back to the, I don't need school. I'm already where I sort of want to be in my life. And so, it was no surprise that when my results came, I flunked school again. And that was the first time in my life that I actually felt disappointment because I've never, even though I've been failing and I've been going through life, and I knew in my, I knew in my heart that I was a smart kid and I would get by just with wit and street cred, you know? But that was the first time that I actually felt disappointment because my dad used up all, his, all of his savings to actually uh, allow me to pursue my dreams. And I sort of kind of threw it all away in that sense. And back into that depression. Yeah, musicians are always very depressed. Huh? So <laughs> back into that, that whole depression thing again, I saw this um, Singapore Idol commercial on television, right? And they are very clever with their ads because they put the winners up there and they have the confetti and they have like the, the, the whole glam and the glitz and the, and the, uh, the music that sort, sort of lifts you up and, and, and makes you think that, you know, oh, this could be me. And I really thought that could be me. I envisioned that to be myself because prior to that, while I was in the, while I was in the ITE, I went for the second season of Idol Audition. No, not many people know this. I went for the second season where Hadi Mirza won. And I saw the queue, and I instead chose to eat Long John Silver's. <laughs> because it was so overwhelming for, for an 18-year-old to see that, you start to think to yourself, if all these people are good, how am I any different from all these people, you know? So I wimped out. So for this third season, I had nothing to lose. I was going to flunk out of school. And uh, my friend Rossi, who was, a, who, who was a vocal major in La Salle as well at the time, he forced me out of bed, called me up at 6 a.m., forced me out of bed. We queued up at, um, even though he didn't get in, we, he followed me to queue up at Cathay for a good 12 hours in the morning. It was raining and then it started shining again. And um, 
just so happens that the producers of the show was also the producers of um, this show that I did back in uh, this show on Channel 5 that was promoting indie bands uh, called um, I don't even remember what it's called anymore anybody of you remember that show? no? yeah it airs at like 11pm who watches shows at 11pm so I was on that show and the producers recognised me and they were like hey uh, it's cool they are coming for audition so they sort of wrote me in I sang they happened to like me for some reason and then I came back for the auditions um, and this time for the judges and I was at the back of my mind I kept thinking like what differentiates me from these people what different what is my story like how how will people actually pay attention to me because what is talent with nobody paying attention to you right so when I went in the room and I saw Dick Lee and the first thing that popped to my mind was, and I had totally no intention of saying this, but maybe it was at the back of my mind. My, the first thing that popped out of my mouth was, I am in no way related to Najib Ali. <laughs> and that sort of like the whole room burst out laughing and they were like, oh my God, you totally look like a younger Najib Ali. And that sort of sparked the attention. And um, throughout the whole competition, like, you know, I didn't really feel I didn't really feel like uh, people labeling me as Najib Ali was an insult or anything. I respect the man a lot. But throughout the whole competition, I felt like I really wasn't trying very hard. Just, it was just like a la-la-la for me. In my head, I sort of felt like the girls were going to win because the girls this, in my season, I mean, Sylvia, Tabitha, they're all amazing vocalists. And um, I really, really didn't expect to win. So when we were in the top three, and me, Tabitha, and Sylvia, um, I told myself that whatever comes, comes. And you know what came? An enlistment letter for national service came. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point in time, I was back, back into that hole again, you see. So I was there finally, after all these things that I've been through, um, getting a chance to actually win a record deal. And uh, I had to serve my national service. So. I sort of gave up in that sense, mentally. I sort of like, uh, I don't really want to win because I don't want to go into Pulau Tekong as the Singapore Idol. <laughs> that would be a shit time. And it was somewhat a shit time. So when I was at the finals with Sylvia in the Singapore Indoor Stadium singing for 10,000 people, we had no floor monitoring because the stage is so big. So every one of us wore in-ear monitors. And we were about to, and when Gamit was about to, to uh, to give the results and we were supposed to go on stage. The winner is supposed to sing the winning song, by the way. So they were going to make a montage of it and they were going to make a music video out of the whole thing. So I told the sound engineers that, I don't even know why I said that, but I said, no lah, don't need to put on my in-ear lah, I sure won't win one. <laughs> and the funny thing was, if you look back at the videos of me, like when he announced my name and I covered my face with my hands, the first thing that went in my head was, how the hell am I going to sing when I can't hear myself? I'm going to make a fool out of myself again. And um, yeah, so that, that whole video was just me pointing mics at people. Like, ah, la la la, confetti. <laughs> confetti, confetti, sing for me. Crowd, you know the lyrics. Um, yeah, it was hilarious. And they didn't turn it into a, to a music video, by the way. They realized that, Cesare, you, you done screwed up right now. Uh, you messed up our plans. And the next day after I won, after hearing my song on the radio for the first time, and a tear rolled down my eye, um, I met up with the producers and my new manager. So it was just another culture shock. I had a manager now. And uh, I have a producer who's going to produce my record. The first thing they said to me was, and this is, this is what I learned about the music industry over the past six years, OK? The first thing they asked me was, how? Uh, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be in national service in the next three days. Everybody was clueless. Um, basically, it was just a clueless time. We sort of took everything a day at a time. Um, I went to Pulau Tekong. Uh, the first thing my CEO said to me was, and that was late, by the way. I was, I was sick, so I was having a fever. I went to the MO, and um, he gave me an MC for two weeks. On my first day of national service, I got an MC for two weeks. <laughs> Chao King. Uh, 
But I was really sick though. I was legitimately sick. And when I came in the, the, the hall, I was the last one to walk in. And I, I could have sworn to you, I could have sworn that they were trying to pull a prank on me because when I walked in, they played this, the winning single, Touched by an Angel. <laughs> Finally, I believe my wings will unfold. And when I came in, everybody looked at me and says, is this a joke? <laughs> is this like, <laughs> this is some sort of grand entrance? With, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a shit time right here. And then the first thing that the CEO said to me, oh, I realized, by the way, that was, that was Safra Radio. Some fan had, had requested, like, oh, Cesare's going to national service today. Let's um, dedicate his song to himself. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so uh, it wasn't a prank. But the first thing my CEO said to me was, I don't give a shit. You know, you know how they are in the army, right? I don't give a shit who you are, the president's son or the Singapore idol. Without even realizing that the Singapore idol was sitting right there in front of him. He didn't know. Uh, so, but gladly, through the support of all my, all, my, all my mates in the NS, I actually did quite have a good time in, in, in national service. Um, besides the fact that on the second day, I got a call from the music and drama company saying, hey, we want you to audition. And then he had to say it in front of the whole battalion, like, hi, Cesare, recruit Cesare, uh, music and drama company wants you to audition in the next two weeks. Everybody looks at me like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that wasn't easy. Um, I came into the music and drama company, get this, okay, auditioned at the music and drama company, band, string ensemble, dancers. My name wasn't on this list, by the way. It was like, a dance audition for you, Cesare. You're scheduled for a dance audition, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what? And so, I danced my little tutu off, by the way. Never have I ever danced in my life. But I did that. And uh, there were lots of laughs, but inevitably I told them that um, I get their intention because they wanted to mold me into an all-round performer. It's like, you already can play guitar, drums, piano, bass, you can sing already, let's make you dance so you can be an all-rounder performer. <laughs> but um, I managed to convince them that uh, I wanted to hone my craft as a musician and having to be around musicians all day, every day from nine to five would really benefit me and my future career. And so they agreed, they had a meeting and all, and they agreed for me to be in the middle on both sides. And I would say that the Singapore Armed Forces Music and Drama Company was really the defining moment in my musical career because I was regimented to practice every day. And I was regimented to set up the equipment to, and our equipment, by the way, isn't like, like 12 inch speakers. It's, we set up line arrays for like concerts. Um, we have like a 32 channel board with like racks that are just like five trolleys full and we would set that up in the morning for a gig. We would sound check ourselves and then we would rehearse ourselves. We would go for dinner, we'd do the show and then we'd tear down ourselves. So it wasn't really like tra-la-la as I expected but I was regimented to do all these things and I was regimented to have rehearsals, I was regimented to have practice, and we would sort of mold our own, uh, we would intake musicians from who would come in, and we sort of would like come up with our own itinerary, like today we are going to do whatever, whatever. Today we are going to do like pocket training, everybody would just groove for an hour with the metronome, and that to me was invaluable in that sense because I'm a, I'm a really lazy person, okay? And that forced me to somewhat come out of my slumber and regiment me once again into becoming a musician. And it's not easy to, to have, like I said, coming out of music and drama company, having to have that own regimentation by yourself, it's really, really not easy. So, um, I mean, also being like a recording artist and having to do gigs here and there and having to practice and all, it really, really isn't easy. So, I'm gonna have a drink. Anticlimactic, right? I was saying, I had a really good time in music and drama company, like I was saying. So, I did a lot of tours with them. We went to Australia and performed. We went uh, around the region, Brunei, everywhere. I got to perform in front of the Sultan of Brunei, who was standing like a meter away from me. 
singing a traditional Bruneian song that I knew nothing of. It's like getting a Malaysian guy to sing for the president's um, home. <laughs> and you're like, the hell is he doing? <laughs> so all these experiences were, were very eye-opening for me, getting to travel the world and see the world. And uh, when I, during my national service also, I, I, I released an album called Take Two. So that was produced by Jason Tan. And that was produced, that was recorded while I was in BMT. So I'd book out on Saturday. I'll go into the studio Saturday night, go home. I'll go back into the studio Saturday morning and I'll book in Sunday night. So it was just recording, writing while being in national service. And <clears throat> I think for what time that we had, we did a pretty good job. And that was my first album. My first single, Broken, um, was commissioned to me by a, a songwriter because we, we sort of, with me being in NS, sort of didn't have time to completely write the whole album. So I wrote, I wrote half the album and half the songs I chose from, from songwriters from all over the world. I was being given that luxury uh, from being a published universal music artist. Mm. So I sort of picked out a song called Broken from this British songwriter called Ben Montague, um, who, recently, who recently is doing quite well. He's touring with The Wanted in U the UK now. And um, so that song became sort of my first single. And that song was um, the number one Asian single, the number one Asian song to be played on ro local radio in the whole year of 2010. So at that, in that year, I think not many local songs were being pushed on air and uh, not many local artists had singles that were, that were pop enough for radio, I guess. Um, we did a music video for that. Uh, we did two other singles that were also on the charts. Uh, every single I did was on the top five charts in 97. And I felt like <clears throat> I needed to, I sort of felt like I needed to push myself more. And I was asking myself, in what ways can I expand my music? Because my, you see, my motivation besides girls <clears throat> has always been to be heard by as many people as I can. So regardless of whether I'm singing in English or singing in Malay or singing in Mandarin or whatever for that matter, I always want the songs to be heard by as many people as they can. So also at that time, without realizing, a single that we didn't push from the album, a song called Matahari, which was a Malay single, which we did no marketing for at all, we didn't push to the radio at all, it got picked up by the Malay radio, it got played all over, and it sort of blew me up into this like, hey, this upcoming Malay singer-songwriter, and like, I never said that. <laughs> I have nine English songs and one Malay song, and you call me a Malay songwriter. I've never written a Malay song in my life. Um, but that sort of opened my eyes into the people that listen to Malay music. And a lot of people <laughs> listen to Malay music without even me realizing. I, was, I kind of took myself out of, from that scene kind of because at that point in time, I sort of felt like I was better than that, but I really wasn't. I went to Java, Java International Jazz Festival. Have you ever been to Jakarta? That is probably the most insane regional festival I've ever been to because Malay music, um, you get artists all over. This year, Jesse J was headlining. Um, last, the year that I went, Corinne Bailey Ray was headlining. And I went to see Corinne Bailey Ray because I missed her concert here. And there are six, ginormous stages, not including other stages around. But when an international act performs, you see like oh, three quarters of the stage of the, of the set is full. But when a local act performs and sings in Malay, there would be a queue that you would have to queue like two hours prior to the gig starting for you to get in. And it was, it was intense. And they were singing every word from every song and these Indonesians, I tell you, they are so musically mature that they would, they would understand like what chords you're playing and they would understand like I would have conversations around me like, oh, his pocket is so tight. Just from like a 14-year-old kid and like another 10-year-old kid down there, so, oh, that lick he was doing that he went to like the minus seven and stuff. And I, was, I was like, I'm surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people who are thinking like this in the Malay music scene. And I kind of felt a bit detached because why haven't I, 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 why haven't I done this earlier? 
So when my deal ended with Universal Music, I was so inspired that I wrote a song called Sayang. And that was my first Malay song that I ever wrote. And um, Sayang was kind of a kind of a, uh, a breakaway for me because at that point in time, I finished my contract with Mediacorp Artist Management. I finished uh, my album deal with Universal. And so I took on um, a friend of mine who um, I admire a lot. I don't know if you guys heard of the Lion City Boy. He's a, he's a rapper who, had, who then had a band called Six. And this band called Six, they were so tight as hell that I was asking around, like, who's managing them? This guy's doing a good job. And uh, I got introduced to Shahid, who is now my manager. And um, I met up with him partially because I was so inspired by the music that Six was making and the attention that Six was getting. They were, they were doing like music festivals around the region. They were doing um, uh, music matters here in Singapore. And I was so impressed by their music that I was like, I want to be involved in this atmosphere, you know? I want to be involved in a musical atmosphere where I'm surrounded by people who make music, who love music, and who would do anything for their music. So, without knowing, Shahid already manages like other acts like Wicked Aura, Batukada, um, Sheikh Haikal. And so I came into the roster and we sort of conceptualized a breakaway plan. So I was kind of tired of people knowing me as the guy who wasn't supposed to win Singapore Idol. Uh, so I got a bit tired of that and I conceptualized sort of a plan for the next couple of years. And in this plan, um, we started a YouTube series called Room to Breathe where I would bring along, I would engineer my own sound and I would bring along a videographer to gigs that I travel overseas. So the first one that we sort of established was in my grandmother's living room. We set up my band there. We did a couple of originals, a couple of covers. We put it up online. It got, a, it got an okay response. Um, I went to um, Kuala Lumpur for some radio interviews and a gig and we got in touch with like Airbnb to hook us up with a place and we recorded there, we filmed there. So it's all about the journey that I go on and getting people to know me as a person because just looking at me sing for two minutes on stage won't really, really allow you to get to know me. Sitting here for an hour listening to me will get you, get you to know me. So I wanted people to sort of understand where I'm coming from instead of just know me as having a preconception of what I'm like. <clears throat> and I even went to the Maldives for the second episode because I was doing a residence, artist residency there for a month. So we were shot in the Maldives, uh, we shot in Kuala Lumpur. I was doing a music festival in Russia and we shot in Russia and that was beautiful. And by doing these uh, YouTube series, I got an email from a guy from Sony Music Malaysia who said that he, really, he was really interested in, in, uh, in my music and what I was doing. And so at that point in time, I had this, I went back to this independent musician mindset. I was doing everything myself, me and my manager Shahid, we were doing everything ourselves. We were <clears throat> producing out of our own pockets. We had complete master control, we had complete control of everything that we were doing. And suddenly a major label comes in like, oh, we really like your music. Um, would you like to come and meet us? And the thing that I found really, really cool and the thing that justified everything that I've been working for so far was when I met them, they had no clue that I was the Singapore Idol at all. And in the back of my head, it was a big hell yeah because I sort of got the attention without the attention. And the deal sort of, sort of had to take shape. It took about close to a year. <clears throat> the company got taken over by another guy uh, called Julius now, and he manages Sony Music Malaysia and Singapore. And so we finalized the deal with Julius. And I realized one thing about the music industry is, if you want your songs to be on radio, um, you have to give up some things. And they're not all necessarily bad things you have to start thinking like the average consumer because as a musician, you only surround yourself with musicians and you only know what musicians think like. You don't know what a guy in a kampung in Seremban would think like. They wouldn't know 
what a pocket is, they wouldn't know which hi-hat you're hitting at what quaver or whatever. And you start to have to develop a songwriting skill that sort of appeals to everyone. And there comes the age old question of, do I want to write my music for me? Or do I want to write my music to be heard? And the compromise that I'm still coming to at this day is, how do you mix both? Because I believe it's possible. It's definitely something that's not impossible. But it's something that is the hardest to achieve. Every artist tries to achieve that balance. And that's still an ongoing thing for me. So the question is, do you go completely uncomfortable with yourself? Or do you be completely comfortable yourself and hope and pray that people will appreciate you for who you are? Which, over the past five years, I can tell you, is not a very big percentage of people. So, I sort of, at this point in time, am trying to um, collaborate both. And the thing I, I realize about the music industry is, sometimes, people try to get you to do things you don't want to do, to make money. And that is also a very, very important thing, to make money. Because without money, think about it this way, where does the label get the money to give you? And you, you as the artist, I'm a new artist, okay? So I'm telling the label like, oh, I don't want your pop songs. I want to write music that I want to write because I have a vision for my music, okay? and they give you the money, where do you think the money comes from? The money comes from another office that makes money off of an artist like, let's say, Katy Perry, who does pop music, so that you can have the liberty of doing your own music because you are self-indulgent. I mean, doesn't that feel a bit selfish to you in that sense? Because it does to me, to some extent. So, you have to come to a I mean, as a musician, it's not wrong to go mainstream or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. It's not wrong to um, completely go uh, niche. If that's what you're into, by all means, go ahead, man. Like, there are some artists that people don't listen to that I still listen to. But it's all about understanding what you want in life. Okay, now we're going to life. What you want in life. Some artists I know that start off... Um, doing like hip hop and they're doing the whole underground indie scene thing and it, they reach the age of 25, 26, 27, they get a girlfriend, they realize they want to settle down, they get a record deal and the label says, oh, you're going to do this song this way. And then they're thinking like, no, I don't want to do this song this way, but I want to get married and have children. I want to give my parents money. I want to give back to my community. How do I do that? And so, the next time you look at, at, an, at a pop artist who sells out, try to think of what was their motivation in music. Because, like I said, not everyone will understand your thinking as a musician. Uh, because you surround yourself with musicians, it's a natural thing. So, the thing is, you have to understand really what you want to achieve a few years down the road. Music and the music industry isn't something that you wake up to and like you have an idea for a song and oh, I'm so inspired right now. I'm gonna smoke some shit and do uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And people are gonna think it's like freaking amazing. It's not like that. When you're in that in real life, it takes planning and it takes certain th sort of thought on where you wanna go a couple years down the road. Yeah, you need to think about what kind of artist you want to become. Whether you want to, you want to go for the, um, I'm a diva and people write songs for me, it ain't wrong. Whether you want to go for um, a songwriter that writes songs for other artists, you know. You sort of, whatever you want to do, what I'm saying is, this whole conversation that we've had for the past 45 minutes, what I'm trying to get at is, you need to have the mental discipline to sort of, um, pace yourself 
besides practice and all the technicalities aside, you need to mentally pace yourself on where you want to go and what you want to achieve. I mean, it's just like financial planning, you know, like you want to save enough money to be able to afford a house five years down the road when you want to marry your future girlfriend. When you want to apply for, for a BTO house, you need, to, you need to, you know, sort of all these things years in advance. And it's kind of like, it's kind of the same when you want to be an artist. You sort of have to sort, sometimes you get a lucky break. I mean, like Pharrell Williams drops by and say, hey, Suzairi, I love your song Broken. Let's do an album. It happens all the time as well. But you cannot just rely on that, rely on that you know. You need to pace yourself and sort of understand at this point, understand what your capability is like also as a musician. And that comes with, musicians are all somewhat sure of themselves. But the question is, what talent are you sure of? I write songs, I produce music. Uh, I play the guitar, I play the drums, I sing. I know I'm not a very good drummer. Um, I know I'm not a very, very good producer. But I know that I'm a relatively good singer who can write really good songs. So you need to understand where your talents are at at this point in trying to gauge your future. And if you know for a fact that you are a better songwriter than a singer, you ought to start working your plans that way. Um, whether your end goal is to write for, I don't know, you can write for Maroon 5. I mean, I have friends who are writing with, I mean, Ted is writing for, for people in LA, working with Frankie J and all these big names. You have to mentally sort out that goal, you see. If you know you're a better songwriter than you are a singer. If you know you're a better singer than you are a songwriter, you sort of have to pace yourself a so totally different way again. Like, sort of have a game plan of what you want to do for the next two or three years. Whether it's surrounding yourself with songwriters who can help you, surrounding yourselves with videographers who might want to help you, you know, um, do things for free and put it up on YouTube. It's all about visibility nowadays as well. And unfortunately for most of us, we don't have the money to be able to say, hey, you, I'll give you 5,000 bucks to make the best freaking YouTube video you can ever imagine. And we're going to put it up and it's going to go viral. Everybody use, uses that nowadays. I want it to go viral. So what's the concept of the video? Viral. You want, a, you want a video to go viral, just film cats, film kittens. Um, but you sort of have to have uh, an ecosystem of your own in your plan of the five years. You need to start to develop an ecosystem of your own in that sense. Surround yourselves with people who can help you and you can help them as well. Um, surround yourselves with people who work as a team. You don't necessarily have to collectively call yourself like Kaki Bukit Club or something, you know. Um, but just surround yourselves with these people. And in doing that, you will realize that the main thing about this industry are two things. People say it's all about looks. I really beg to differ. It's about talent, for sure. And it's about how much people like you. That's, it all boils down to these two things. Because I am not necessarily very talented compared to other local musicians, I have to admit. But I think my talent in, is talking. As you have heard me talking non-stop for the past 15 minutes. I didn't think I could do this, by the way. But I've been talking non-stop for 15 minutes. It's a mouth phone. So I have had a lot of interviews and gigs. And I've been to a lot of proposals and meetings where I'll just convince people to do things for me just because I feel like I know that I'm so passionate about what I'm talking about and I'm so sure that this passion is so infectious, right? That you would so want to work with me even without knowing like what I'm trying to do. For all you know, I'm trying to open a, a fruit stall at like Geylang Serai and you're like, I'll do it for you, Cesare. What are we doing again? Um, but yeah, I, I realize that's my talent and I weigh that to my advantage because I believe passion is infectious and you just have to find a way to sort of channel that into the people that you surround yourself with. So once you surround yourself with these people, you sort of, and have that game plan, you really, really have to stick to it. You can't say one day, I'm gonna wake up and, oh, my friend just, and this happens to me all the time, by the way, like, oh, my friend just 
just had a job opportunity at blah 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 and he's earning blah 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 and i'm like nope and it's never occurred to me in any time that i could be doing anything else other than music and i have as a musician um since we're on this topic right now how you earn money as a musician i have earned money in so many different ways as a musician that i realize that you really can um live as a musician you really really can in singapore in singapore you really really can you just have to be smart about knowing how to earn your money i've earned money from writing songs i've earned money from doing commercials i've earned money from um writing songs for other people in fact i just wrote a song a mandarin song or well, actually i just translated a mandarin song in malay uh, for this upcoming sg50 project that we're doing and i've earned money from corporate gigs or oh, they throw money at you by the way take note um i've earned money from putting stuff up on my instagram you know so there's so many ways in this vast social media network nowadays that you can earn money as a musician so don't ever think of yourself as just a songwriter because at the end of the day people want to know what you're doing people want to know who you are what you're doing and they sort of in that sense want to live vicariously through you people follow you not because um you are so and so but they follow you because a part of them wants to live like you you know a part of them wants to know like you follow a fashion blogger for example like you always say like oh when i look in the mirror i wish i was jenny oh my god and you you follow dan dan bilzerian and you're like i wish i was a playboy billionaire who takes pictures of butts all day long um you know you people live vicariously through you and as musicians it's a privilege you know being a musician is a privilege never think of it as 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 a, something that's non beneficial to you or or something that's hard oh being a musician is hard i don't uh, barely eat being a musician is a privilege and being able to be so privileged as to let other people live vicariously through your work i think that is that's the pinnacle of of for me that's the pinnacle of life and living life is to get to inspire other people to live their lives better and i'm not saying like you should inspire people by putting ins- inspiring quotes or like life is like a box of chocolates or putting Maham- mahatma gandhi quotes to people all i'm saying is you don't realize that each and every one of you right here just by doing what you do you are already inspiring a 10 year old an 8 year old you know a future musician who's thinking about becoming a singer and it's the same as when i watch taufik batisa on tv on that podium with confetti flying in his ear i'm like i want confetti to fly in my ear too you know and mentally you sort of prepare yourself we're going back to the plan now and mentally you sort of preparing yourself i want to win singapore idol without even knowing you're sort of putting up a game plan in your mind but at, back to it again you sort of have to know where you want to go what you're doing and the main two things the talent and really really how much people like you so if people don't like you try to work on that okay yeah i think that's about it <laughs> it's a new record for me talking for what 55 minutes very, very anybody have any questions for me that you want to yeah we have a lot of song writing students here yeah what kind of <laughs> socks i like to wear or... <laughs> yes in IT what course did i take and i studied business information technology and um i was too busy chasing girls around to be honest but i believe that everything you do in life sort of leads you to where you are inevitably going you know like every little thing you do from like giving money to to a homeless person or um like you know singing in the bathroom for your grandmother i believe every everything you do sort of sort of like 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 the way of the universe you know it sort of prepares you for this thing that you're going to become in the end and sometimes it takes a really long time sometimes it takes a really short time but i wouldn't say like being in a certain school helped me a certain way 
but I felt that it helped me grow as a person and it helped me think differently as well. Any other questions? Yes. What is one advice would you someone who would want to go to a singing competition like Singapore Idol? What? Sorry, again? What is an advice would you someone who would go to a singing competition? A singing competition like Singapore Idol. I guess I guess Going into Idol, I sort of knew what I was getting myself into. And you have to know what you're getting yourself into. Whether at the end of the day, you want a record deal, or by all means, you want to be seen on TV. I mean, people do want to be seen on TV. You know, there are lots of those people. And people who just want, to, want other people to hear them sing, you want to impress people or whatever, you got to know what you want out of it. Like, if you want a record deal, there are a lot of ways to get a record deal. Um, if you want to do it fast, then a reality competition is definitely the way to go. But you also have to understand who's giving you that record deal. What can they ensure for your future? Because signing a record deal isn't really ensuring your fame at, at all. Winning Singapore Idol, winning the final one or whatever it is, doesn't ensure your success at all. By no means does it ensure your success. You have to understand what they are giving you and you have to understand what you are getting in return. And you have to also understand what you can give to them. Because at the end of the day, it's all about making money. And no label will ever go up to you and tell you that, oh, I love your music. Here's $20,000. Do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> no, no label in the history of the universe has ever said that. Even if they said that, there'll be this a &R guy in the corner making sure you don't, you don't do up to no good, you know? But my, my advice to you is to really understand what you want out of it. And if you want to go, I say just go for the experience, you know? Pick a good song. These are all the basics that you should know already as a singer. Pick a good song. Don't sing it like the original. These are all the basics. Don't sing it like the original. Don't do it like someone else has done before. Don't pick a song that's too high key for you. Don't pick a song that's unsuitable for your voice texture. Pick a song that will... Because you only have one, one, one chance. You only get to make one impression. Pick a song that will turn heads. These are all the basics that you already should know. But what I'm telling you is, looking ahead, what, really, what, what do you want out of it? Yeah. Is my question to you now. What, what do you want out of it? You can answer. Oh. <laughs> There's a thought? There's an audition tomorrow, right? Yeah. Uh, go for it, man. How was it? It was quite an experience, right? No matter, no matter how professional you are, I can tell you that any, every time I step on stage, I still gag. I have this like nervous reflex, like acid reflux, it will go like whoa. No matter how experienced you are, and I'm not that experienced, but no matter how small the gig or how big the gig, a stage will always scare the shit out of you, so get used to it. <laughs> Any other questions? What about advice for songwriters? Like, is, how, would, how should a Singapore songwriter you know, put himself or herself out there? I don't think songwriters should view themselves, this is a common mistake, okay? Don't view yourself as a Singapore songwriter. Be proud that you're from Singapore, but don't restrain your level of thinking into, into, into thinking that, oh, I'm a Singapore songwriter. I only write songs with references that I hear from other Singaporean songwriters. Mm. Never ever do that. <coughs> Think about it this way. Um, Yuna got picked up by Pharrell by singing in this bar in Los Angeles that only a couple people attended and he just walked in there in random, you know? You can get your song heard anywhere and everywhere. So if you have restrictions on how you think of yourself as a songwriter, like if you only write ballads or whatever, never have that restriction. I used to only think that I could write like ballads because I'm a very depressed and sad person, right? So once you have that mindset, you'll tend to always, your ear is very clever, your mind I mean, but you will only pick out things that you want to hear and the things that you don't want to hear, you sort of throw it all away. Mm. So in that sense, if you already restrict yourself as, as a songwriter to like, oh, I'm going to write a song based on blah, blah, blah and the things that I listen to, you are only going to write songs like that. So as a songwriter, I think the most 
important thing is go out of your comfort zone, man. Really, like, yeah. Do, do, some, do some crazy shit. Like, go to music festivals. I mean, if you, if you want to get drunk, get drunk. Do crazy things with crazy people. Experience life, you know. Listen to music. Listen to what your friends are listening. Listen to what their friends are listening. Just because it doesn't appeal to you, don't stop listening to it, you know. Try to understand it. Try to understand, like, I was trying to understand Frank Ocean for like the longest period of time until the recent album, and I still don't understand it. But what I'm saying is, try to understand where that person is coming from. Um, try to get out of your comfort zone. Try to write songs not only about yourself, because that's the, that's the first step, right? You write songs based, based on your experiences, but try to write songs based on other people's experiences, based on what you see. Some things are hard to be penned down, like a, like a patriotic song, for example. There are only so many ways you can write, I love Singapore. But who says it can't be done in a contemporary manner, you know? Try to get out of your comfort zone, do things that you don't normally do. And being a songwriter, by the way, isn't just sitting down and writing songs. It's a part of your being. It's a part of you living your life. So if you've never been to a club, go to a club. If you've never been windsurfing, go windsurfing, you know? These things will inevitably change your being and the way you look at things. And it will inevitably also change the way you write songs. So never just think of songwriting as a pen, a paper, an instrument, and penning down your thoughts. Because it isn't just always about your thoughts. It's about your experiences. It's about your entire being as well. And it's about you being out there experiencing the world. So, yeah. Any final question? What kind of burgers do I like to eat? <laughs> if not, let's wrap up. Thank you. That's All right. Thank you guys for listening.